it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and the kind of sexual immorality that is not even tolerated among the Gentiles. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Shouldn't you be filled with grief and remove from your congregation the one who did this? Even though I am absent in the body, I am present in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who has been doing such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus, hand that one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole batch of dough? Clean out the old leaven, so that you may be a new unleavened batch, as indeed you are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us observe the feast, not with old leaven, or with the leaven of malice and evil, but the, with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not mean the immoral people of the world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Otherwise, you would have to leave the world. But actually, I wrote you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister and is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or verbally abusive, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such a person. For what business is this of mine to judge outsiders? Don't you judge those who are inside? God judges outsiders. Remove the evil person from among you. This is the word of God. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's good to see you all. Um, if you're visiting with us, you've picked a great Sunday to be here. Um, it is one of the, uh, my great comforts, actually, in an, uh, being in a church that's committed to preaching through Scripture. Um, uh, we pick a book of the Bible, and we preach through it, and God speaks to us through it. And this way... Um, the minister doesn't get to avoid the things that he doesn't like to preach on, and you don't get to avoid the things you don't like to hear. Uh, so this is how God uh, speaks to us. So we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and uh, <clears throat> uh, let's have a look uh, at this passage. Father, we, uh, we must come to you um, every time we come to Scripture, but particularly when we come to passages that in many ways seem foreign to how much of the church these days functions. Um, give us uh, listening ears, uh, overcome barriers that um, we put up um, because of our social context or because of our cultural context, or because of our own sinful hearts, uh, and help us to hear what it is you are saying uh, to the church um, and to respond rightly to it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, as a pastor now for some years, it's quite difficult uh, to come to passages like this because, you know, I, th I often think of my, my own failure to obey passages like chapter 5. Um, and uh, in my early years as a pastor, one of our leaders in our church um, was quite prominent, um, was actually li living in a very ungodly way, and we knew about it, and, um, and kind of kept putting off calling him out on it, and to my shame, probably about a year before we finally confronted him. Um, on this, and he was, and he was very bolshy and and um, overwhelming and 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 kind of verbally very pushy and um, kind of intimidating. And he was older than me, 
And um, so it was very hard to do. And it was very hard to convince the rest of my leadership to do it as well. Everyone kind of dodged. Uh, but we eventually did call him out. Um, and it was really hard. And it went very badly. And he didn't listen to us. And he got very angry and threatened us. And then left. And went to another church. And the same thing happened. And then he went to another church. And the same thing happened. And he went to another church. And the same thing happened. Until eventually the spectacular collapse became public. And in an awful mess that damaged many people. It all came out. Um, you know, my only hope for his soul was that in shame or whatever, he killed himself. And I think maybe there was some conviction of sin there in the end. But the pain of having to deal with public sin in the church is, is something very real and very hard. But it will be much harder for us if we don't. It will be extremely hard for us if we don't. And we need to pay attention to passages like 1 Corinthians 5, the most extensive passage in the New Testament on church discipline. Um, because if we don't, it will be to our own peril. And I think what strikes me from 1 Corinthians 5 is how far off track much of our 21st century church is in the light of this passage. And how ignorant much of our 21st century is of the instructions of this passage. Paul moves from dealing with divisions within the Corinthian church, chapter 1 to 4, to dealing with another not surprising problem in this haughty and overconfident church, which is the failure of the leadership to act in the face of even the most blatant sins. Do you see the problem there in verse 1? It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife, and you are proud. Now, this man is probably somebody who's quite prominent in the church, somebody who's probably quite influential, and is in a sexual relationship with, <coughs> the wording tells us that it's his stepmother. Actually, it's the wording straight from Leviticus 18, where God says, you don't sleep with your mother, and then the next one is, you don't sleep with uh, your father's wife, referring to a stepmother. Um, and and um, <coughs> this it's possible that uh, the stepmother's divorced from this man's father um, and he's got into a relationship with her. They're not likely married. It doesn't say that they're married. She's not likely a Christian because she's not included in the discipline that Paul is talking about with this man. So she's outside of the circle of believers. And he says this is something that's so shocking, even the unbelievers of the day don't accept this. Um, and that's not unusual, by the way. I mean, we see this, this scandal after scandal about some church where, that has done something so shocking that even the unbelievers are horrified. Now, we know that unbelievers love to be horrified and point fingers at the church, so it's not always the case. But it is true that the church has been regularly rocked by sex abuse scandals, child abuse scandals, financial embezzlement scandals that the world sensationalizes and is shocked at, like that, as if they would never do it. Of course, we know they would. But uh, it's sad and not unusual that that kind of thing happens. And it's possibly here that the Corinthians, as part of their boasting, are saying, oh, we're not subject to the world's conventions, just as we're not subject to, um, to the old laws of the Old Testament. So we, we're not subject to those things. And there was also a, a kind of a philosophical mood of the day of saying that physical things don't matter. Your, your, your body doesn't matter. So whatever you do with your body doesn't matter. It's the spirit that matters. And that kind of dualism is very dangerous um, and unbiblical. And so Paul is saying, you know, what you're doing and what you're tolerating is so dangerous here. Um, uh, and, and the thing that, the issue, the issue that Paul is really dealing with, not so much even this person's sin, but the church's response to it. The church's response is the main focus of Paul's uh, chastising, verse 2, and you are proud. This is what he's really shocked about. This person is carrying on with a sinful relationship, and you as a church, you're, you're boasting about it. You're proud. The word is literally puffed up. Puffed up is the word. 
Uh, and it's such a great description of the Corinthians. They're so full of themselves, like a big balloon that's puffed up, full of hot air. There's nothing in it. There's no substance. You're proud. You're puffed up in the face of this. And you're going, ha, 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 wonderful. That, 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 you're puffed up. You're proud. That's the shock here for Paul, is how proud this church is in the face of this prominent person in this uh, ungodly sexual relationship. By the way, that word proud, or the literal word puffed up, only appears in the New Testament seven times. It only appears in the New Testament seven times. Six of those are in 1 Corinthians. Six of those are in 1 Corinthians. Are you, are you <coughs> wondering what the message of 1 Corinthians is all about? Six times this puffed up, proud church is rebuked by Paul. Uh, this overconfident, arrogant, proud, immature uh, group of believers in Christ. And Paul's saying, how can you be like this? Shouldn't, verse 2 goes on to say, shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? How can you be proud about this? How can you, how can you be smirking about this? You shouldn't be boasting about this. You should be brokenhearted about this. You should be brokenhearted about this. How can you just smile and wave when this sort of ungodliness is prominent in your church family? But of course we do. We do. We kind of just, you know, awkwardly move on. It is why I call this passage the cancer of compromise. And it happens very subtly. It happens very subtly. Everyone's happy. And then, um, you know, one of the Bible study leaders... You know, moves in with his girlfriend, and it's a bit awkward at first, and with hello, <laughs> and no one says anything, and uh, it's awkward, but eventually you get used to it, and it just carries on, and people don't really say anything about that anymore, because everyone's doing it anyway, and eventually somebody elects that guy to counsel. It's too late to say anything now, because you'd be a hypocrite, so, oh, okay, we'll just let him be nominated, and see what happens, and he gets on to counsel, and then you know, eventually that becomes the norm because even the leadership are doing it. And then the pastor will find a way to kind of justify it. And you'll go, well, they're married in the sight of God anyway and stuff. And then it becomes acceptable. And then you just carry on and then everyone else is doing it too. And eventually what becomes acceptable becomes what is promoted. And the church did this in the 20th century with sexual immorality and people living together. And the church is doing it in the 21st century with homosexual immorality. And even boasting about it in our church circles. It is the cancer of compromise. The sin that no one talks about eventually becomes the sin the church boasts about. And this is, by the way, the pattern throughout church history. The quietly tolerated sin becomes the public boast. The sin that society actually approves of becomes the sin that the church accepts. And the church has boasted about this all through. You look through church history. Um, <coughs> Christian polygamy. That's what the society wanted. It got rubber stamped. Christian slavery. Christian racism. Christian sexual immorality. Christian homosexual immorality. Whatever society wants, the church eventually puts a rubber stamp on it. And much of our church today is celebrating a sexual immorality that 50 years ago would have been unbelievable for the church to accept. Unbelievable. And now it's the norm. And it puts us in a very dangerous position when we do that. Now, this is a very long introduction. <laughs> I haven't even started my first point yet. Um... But uh, it's an important scene setter. And there are three things that I want us to learn from this passage. Why is dealing with this kind of sin in the church, this public sin, this sin amongst prominent people in the church, so important? Well, first of all, we deal with it for the sake of the, the offender. We discipline for the sake of the sinner, in other words. It's not disciplining so that we can seem good. It's actually for the soul of the person who is living in unrepentant sin. And it's important to remember that <clears throat> the history of the church is a story of pendulum swinging. And we never seem to get this grace and truth thing right. And we're always swinging from one extreme to the other. And either the church is 
burning heretics at the stake or praising heretics in the pulpit. We just seem to swing from the one to the other. We, we, um, <coughs> uh, we always uh, struggle because of our own sinful nature. And we're kind of in the swing at the moment away from authority and discipline. And it's largely rooted in the backlash against abusive authority, which was so common uh, in, in uh, previous generations. And that abuse of authority now uh, is showing in this backlash against authority. And we're also in an age where, <coughs> where the individual is king. Um, and we, we really have this view that the individual is right and the institution is wrong or evil. And, and that uh, view of the, of the individual and the institution affects how we live. It affects how society runs. And so the individual's rights become more important than the community's rights. And, 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 and what the individual wants is more important than what the people want. Uh, and you see this in government. Why, why do you think people are shamelessly corrupt? Because it's all about them. It's all about them. It's my position to you, use for my needs and for what I want. We see this in our schools. We see this in our schools where the, the authority of the school is gone. The authority of the teacher is gone. It's the parent that says everything. And now we're trying to swing back from that. And actually, uh, the, 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 the corrective to that is also going to be very dangerous looking at this latest education bill. And you see this in society where your sexual choices and what you particularly identify with and however you want to assert that means everyone else has to, accompany, uh, has to uh, accommodate that. Everyone else has to now accommodate that. Because the individual is more important than the community. And we see this in church where the member is above accountability. And don't you dare hold someone to account because there's a hundred other churches to go to. So you never have to be confronted about your sin. You never have to be called to repent because there's a hundred other options where somebody won't say anything to you and you'll be applauded for your particular wickedness. And this is the context in which God calls His church to exercise biblical discipline. And that's very difficult. But we are called to do it, not because we want to be arrogant, but because we are concerned for the soul of the unrepentant person. That's why Paul calls on the church to, to act on this. Verse 3, For my part, even though I'm not physically present, I am with you in spirit as one who is present with you in this way. I've already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus on the one who's been doing this. He's talking about... I've already said what you need to do. You need to put this person out. Now you need to put this in place. Why? <clears throat> well, he goes on, verse 4. When you are assembled, now I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present. By the way, <clears throat> the language here is very much Matthew 18, the other discipline passage in the New Testament. And <clears throat> yo, I don't know if it's these air conditioners or... <clears throat> what, but I'm running out of voice here. Some of you might be encouraged by that. Um, the power of our Lord Jesus is present. This is uh, Matthew 18, where the church is, talk, is taught by Jesus to exercise discipline. And the, there's a verse at the end of that passage where Jesus says, where two or three of you are there, there I am with you. That's, that's not uh, that the Holy Spirit is present when two or three are there in its church. It's actually in the context of discipline that Jesus is there with the leaders of his church as they gather together and make agreement as to how to deal with something uh, in the sense of discipline. And so he says, the Lord Jesus is present with you when you are doing this. Verse 5, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Now that language sounds very extreme, but it's actually very common in that context. Uh, Paul uses it as well in Timothy where he talks about handing over Hymenaeus and Alexander to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Because the understanding in that context is that the prince of this world is the evil one. And, um, and the church in this world is a church in the midst of a world that's under control of the evil one. And when you hand someone to Satan, it means you're putting them outside of fellowship in your church family and putting them in the world. Putting them in the world. You're, ref you're, you're, you're really handing them over to their sin because they refuse to repent. Because they refuse to acknowledge their sin and do something about it. And you're saying, well, then you are outside of our fellowship. You're outside of this family of believers. And why do we do that? 
We do that in the hope that that person will come to their senses and repent. This is the prodigal son being given his inheritance to go and spend it with prostitutes and drunkards in the hope that he'll come to his senses and turn back to the father. It's handing him over. It's what drug counselors say to parents again and again and parents who refuse to listen again and again. I've had this conversation a hundred times. Let your drug-addicted son go. Cut him off. Because if you continue to enable him, he's already lost. It's already over. But there is a hope. There's a risk. But if you cut him off, there is a hope that they'll hit rock bottom and come to their senses and turn back and come for help. It may not happen. That person may be lost and go. But, but if you don't do anything, you've already lost. If you don't do anything, you've already lost. That's what Paul is saying here. You need to make, you need to make the hard call for that person's sake. Because if you don't, it's already over for that person. Because you're just condoning what God calls us to be convicted of and repent. We call out unrepentant sin because it is best for that person. It's the only hope for that person because if there is no repentance and if you live unrepentant in your life, no conviction of sin, no brokenness about your sin, the concern is that maybe you're not even saved. Maybe you're not even saved. And the only hope of finding out is if you're left to it. You're left to it. And maybe you'll wake up after being removed from the comforts of fellowship to recognize what a dangerous place you are in. We discipline for the hope of the unrepentant sinner and their salvation. We also discipline, secondly, for the sake of the church family. We discipline for the sake of the church family. Look at verse 9. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. Paul wrote another letter. We don't, we don't have that letter. But he wrote a letter to the Corinthians and said, stop associating with sexually immoral people. And they thought that Paul meant the world. And Paul's saying, no, I'm talking about the world. I'm not talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about people within your church. And again, this is something that the church often gets wrong. And we point fingers at the immoral world and say, look how terrible they are. Why are you doing that? They're not professing to follow Jesus. It's not for us to point fingers at the world. They can do what they like. It's not for us to point fingers at them. And we just become hypocrites then anyway. We should be looking at ourselves. Looking at our own hearts. Pointing at our, at our own failures. That's what Paul is saying. That's why he says in verse 11, I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral, greedy, an idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard, a swindler. Don't even eat with such people. He's talking about someone in the church. Yeah, 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 I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Yeah. Um, I missed the morning service. I was so bubbleless. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian, yeah. Ugh, a little affair with my secretary every now and again. It's okay. Yeah, you, you're going to need it. I mean, how can you say that? Paul says, don't assure someone that they're a Christian when they're not acting like one. When they're not acting like one. These are public lifestyle sins of a person that's just not broken, not repentant, not convicted of their sin. And all of us are sinners. But if someone is bullshit about it and part of the church and publicly unashamed of it, something is terribly wrong. Something is terribly wrong. And Paul says that will infect the whole church. That's why he says don't even eat with such a person. Eating is a public sign of a close relationship or fellowship. Don't even eat with such a person. He's not talking about the outsiders. Again, verse 12. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? Look at your own family. Because your own hearts. God's going to judge those outside. The world is God's um, place to deal with. God entrusts us to deal with the family of believers. And when these extreme cases come, he says in verse 13, expel the wicked person from among you. Expel the wicked person from among you. And that's pointing to uh, Deuteronomy 
Because that verse is said a number of times in Deuteronomy, where um, Paul says, uh, uh, where Moses says to the believers, you've got, you've got to do something about this. This is unacceptable. This is what you've got to do something about. And there's a list of seven times in which this appears. Expel the, pers- uh, the wicked person from among you. Seven times in Deuteronomy, it says that. And it's talking about false prophets, worshipping other gods, false witnesses, rebellious son, immoral woman, adultery, kidnapping, and slavery. Things in which, if the church tolerates it and does, some, and does nothing about it, it's going to infect the whole church. It's a question of holiness. Now, I tell you, this is not what we want to do. This is not what I want to do. Because we don't want to offend, we don't want to be rejected. We don't want to lose our own comforts. But if we just say nothing about this, it'll infect everything. It'll infect everything. And it's very hard, especially if it affects relationships or affects your finances. I remember having to speak to a young pastor in a church, and he had a a, a prominent person on his council who was very bullying, very abusive, and very manipulative. Uh, and I said to him, like, why aren't you taking a stand against this guy? Why aren't you saying something about it? And he said to me, as straight as this, uh, and, as de- and with defeat in his voice, he said, if I say something to him, I will lose my salary. I will lose my salary. And so he feared confronting this man because of losing his salary instead of, and I, I sympathize with him, But we must fear God, not men. And if we continue to condone uh, sinful behavior in our church, we are really saying that sin doesn't matter. And if we are saying that sin doesn't matter, then we are also saying that the cross doesn't really matter. Because if God takes your sin so seriously that He sends His Son to take your punishment... How dare we just laugh off sin? How dare we just laugh it off? That's how seriously God takes it. That he won't even withhold his own son to deal with the punishment we deserve. How can we just laugh it off? And it is why, thirdly and lastly and most importantly, and the most important context that you need to grasp here, because otherwise you're going to think I'm being arrogant, is that we discipline in the light of the cross. We discipline in the light of the cross. Look at the core section of this chapter, verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I mean, I really think Paul's been having his quiet times in Deuteronomy because there's so much Deuteronomy here. And this is the Passover instructions here. This is Passover language. And the whole language here is about Passover. What happens at Passover when the Israelites in slavery in Egypt um, (coughs) are called to prepare to escape to freedom? Uh, Part of the instructions was to get rid of the yeast to bake unleavened bread so that they could get ready to go quickly because the yeast took time to um, permeate. What do do you call it? Prove, rise, yeah, infect, whatever, the dough. And so God's saying, um, get rid of the yeast. And then Paul uses that analogy as the church understands it and is used many times, including by Jesus, that yeast is an is, is a, a illustration of sin. That when a little bit of yeast gets in the dough, it, in, it, it infects or leavens the whole thing. It spreads <coughs> through the whole thing. See what he says there. A little yeast leavens the whole batch. One bad apple ruins the whole barrel. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul actually says, bad company corrupts good character. Get rid of the old yeast um, or the old leaven. By the way, it's probably depending on your translation, but leaven and yeast, there's a slight difference between the two. Yeast is the, the actual powder or whatever that you get, but leaven 
which was more likely what the Israelites were using, um, when they mixed a batch of dough and mixed in the yeast, they would cut off a piece of the, of the uh, dough and keep that little block after they baked that bread and they would leave that to kind of yeastify and then use it the next week for the next batch of bread and they would just keep passing it on and on and on. And that would be called leaven, that little piece that you cut and you kept with the yeast in it for the next batch of dough that you made. Interestingly, every year at Passover, the Israelites are called to get rid of the leaven, to get rid of the yeast and start again, find some yeast and start from scratch and do it again. Why? Because if you kept using that piece of leaven again and again and again and again and again, <coughs> um, you know, it, it would be like you know, going to the cafe down the road where they fry the same chips in the oil that they've been doing since my mother was born, you know. <laughs> it's going to become poisonous and infect you. Actually, in God's wisdom, that's, you know, preserving the health of the Israelites so that the leaven had to get cleaned out once a year and they'd start from scratch because otherwise they'd be poisoned by it eventually. It would make them sick. So there's wisdom even in that. But the analogy is, of course, to sin. So get rid of the old leaven, get rid of it, <coughs> because Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Get rid of the old yeast, or the old leaven, so that you may be a new unleavened batch, verse 6 goes on to say, as you really are. As you really are. This is who you are. This is what Christ has done for you. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Your sin has already been atoned for. The lamb has already been slain. His blood has been painted on the doorposts of your heart so that when the angel of death comes in judgment, he will pass over you and you will escape judgment. You're already saved because the lamb has been slain. So be who you are. You see what he says there? So that you may be a new unliving batch as you really are. Be who you are. Because you are in Christ. That's what he's saying here. That's what he's saying. Be who you are. That's why we repent, because we're called to be like Jesus. It's not so that you can become a Christian. It's what happens when you do become a Christian. So be who you are. That's what discipline is saying. You say you're a Christian, act like it. So, verse 8. Let us keep the festival, or let us keep the feast. Now here again, um, he's talking about the festival of unleavened bread. Now if you know your Jewish festivals, the festival of unleavened bread is a seven-day festival. And it happens from uh, the first day of Passover on. And what would happen with the Israelites, the first time that they did this, was, um, you know, they were in slavery, they baked the unleavened bread, they escaped into freedom through the crossing of the Red Sea and on the way to the Promised Land. And they, <coughs> they traveled, keeping the festival of unleavened bread, removing the leaven, leaving the leaven behind. That's what Paul is saying here. He's not talking about a ceremony. He's not talking about a ceremony. So you, you're not going to leave here, you know, and, <coughs> I don't know, go to Need Bakery and say, oh, oh, no ciabatta for me. You know, I'm leaving that behind. No sourdough. He's not saying that. He's saying you leave your sin behind. That's how you keep the festival of unleavened bread. Because you're escaping from slavery to sin through the blood of the Lamb, and you're traveling on your way to the promised land. What do you do? You leave the leaven behind. You leave it behind. That's how you keep the festival. That's why Paul says there in verse 8, not with the old bread, leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of matzos, sincerity and truth. It's your life. It's your life. Where you're sincere and truthful with one another. Where there's a genuine grappling with sin with one another. Where you're holding each other accountable. Where you're encouraging one another. Where you're seeking to walk in Christ-likeness. And where we together as a family help one another to do that. You see, the entire passage about discipline here, it's not about us coming and being abusive and beating the sheep. It's about us holding one another accountable as we, as we reflect what it means to be Christ's saved people 
keeping the festival of unleavened bread, leaving the leaven behind and going to the promised land together. The Passover lamb has been sacrificed for you. So let's leave the yeast behind. And that has hard applications to us in our daily lives as the family of believers, as we live and do life in Christ together. There is an obligation on us as a gathered family of believers to be the people Christ has saved us to be, to be serious about sin, which drove Christ to the cross to save us, and to be serious about walking together in holiness. The communion words that we read Every time we gather together, we're originally given to these very Corinthians. They're taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we say them every time we gather around the table. And they were originally said to a group of selfish, proud, immature, individualistic babies in Christ. And as much as they're a word of instruction. They're also a word of rebuke. Listen to the words. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then he goes on to say, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. You see, we often leave that part out. We don't call uh, uh, each other to examine our hearts to reflect on what God is calling us to turn away from. And that particular Corinthian church was full of selfishness, didn't care about others, didn't look after the needs of others in the church. They were just there about themselves. And Paul says, God has even made some of you sick because of this, and some of you have died, because God will not tolerate this kind of unholiness in his church. And we need to think about that as we come and eat together. Is there something between us and someone else? Is there something that I need to make right for someone else? Is there something that I need to repent of that I've been tolerating in my life? Maybe you need to do that before you eat and drink judgment on yourself in an unrepentant way at the table. Let's reflect together as we bow our heads. You need to ask the Lord, is there something that I'm tolerating in my own life is there something that I'm turning a blind eye to in my church family's life? Is there something in my life that is just so common now, I don't even notice it as something that is contrary to your word? Am I turning a blind eye to sexual transgressions or ethical transgressions in my business or prejudice or drunkenness or greed? or slander and gossip. There is an opportunity for us to confess together as God's people to the Lord as we continue to say that prayer of confession from Psalm 51. Let's say it together. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions 
and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Amen.